have a date with the angel. Starring Betty White. Bill Williams as Gus Angel. Presented by Limo. Star of the Forward Look. And the Plymouth Dealers of America. The time, seven months after Vicky and Gus Angel were married. The main character, Francis. License number 34728. The plot, a shaggy dog story. Mrs. Deets, I did not buy the cookies for... You're not giving me a chance to explain. Honey, you don't owe that woman an explanation. When your little girl came to the door with the cookies, I didn't have any change. And when the Grayson girl got here, I did. It's as simple as... Spite had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Mrs. Deeks, I will not allow my wife to get mixed up in a neighborhood feud about a bunch of silly, silly cookies. You stay up at your end of the block, we'll stay down here, and we'll get along just fine. <laughs> well, I guess I told her, huh? You sure did. Only she hung up on me. <laughs> oh, well, uh, maybe it's just as well that way. Vicki, I think we should at least consider moving out of this neighborhood. Oh, honey, no. This is not a neighborhood. It's a battlefield. <laughs> we can stay out of their quarrels, only... Only don't talk about moving away. Gosh, honey, I just love this house. We we picked it out together, and I couldn't think of... Works a little early tonight. He usually doesn't lose his dog till 8.30. <laughs> well, at least he loves Francis. Sure, sweetie, but wouldn't Murph be more sensible buying a lock for the gate than wandering around the neighborhood with a plate of liver? <laughs> Ten to one, he blames the whole thing on the Finleys. Hi, kids. Hi, Murph. Have you seen Francis? No. You, you want us to help you find him? Oh, no, this is old stuff for me and Francis. You know who lets him out every night, don't you? Those miserable Finleys next door to me. Do you mean they deliberately open your gate? No. Francis jumps over the fence into their yard, and they leave their gate open. <laughs> How's Kathy? Oh, swell. She's spending the weekend with that no-good sister of hers. <laughs> well, <clears throat> see you later, kids. Bye, Murph. So long, Murph. Francis! Come and get your daddy's liver! <laughs> see, darling? It can be done. <laughs> I guess it can at that. And, honey, I feel the same as you about this house. Oh, darling. <laughs> Oh, no, don't tell me he's run out of liver already. <laughs> Honey, we've got to do something about this neighbor. Well, hi, Mr. Finley. Hello, Mrs. Angel. Hello, Mrs. Angel's husband. <laughs> Hello, Mr. Finley. I've come to say goodbye. Oh, well, come on in a minute. You taking a trip? No, I'm running away from home. Again? Where are you going, Mr. Finley? Oh, I guess I'll just get out on the highway and follow the radiator cap. And that isn't easy when you don't have a car. <laughs> How's your son? Rotten to the core. <laughs> you should hear the things he said to me. We'd rather not know, Mr. Finley. What Mr. Angel means is, we can all remain good friends if we don't know too much about each other's problems. I don't care what he means. I wasn't going to tell you anyway. <laughs> I am glad we all think alike. Because it's none of your business. <laughs> right. You have a wonderful runaway. If my son Roger comes looking for me, tell him not to worry. I brought my nightshirt. We will. Tell him if he wants me, I'll be at a cheap hotel somewhere, hungry and cold. We will. Tell my boy that after they throw me out of the cheap hotel, I'll probably last a week or two before I starve, so he mustn't worry. <laughs> Goodbye, Mr. Finley. Goodbye. 
See what I mean? You have to live in this neighborhood in order to believe it. <laughs> well, you have to admit, he's kind of cute. He did everything but play hearts and flowers. <laughs> and that suit. He dresses like he hasn't a dime, and you and I both know we could buy and sell everybody on the block. <laughs> Can't you see him wandering around downtown someplace and people are handing him money for cups of coffee? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he went through that whole routine just so we'd ask him to stay overnight, you know. I know it, and for once we were smart enough not to fall for it. <laughs> Gus, you don't think might get into trouble, do you? How? Oh. oh, I don't know. I just get a picture of him wandering around downtown. <laughs> and I get a picture of him being picked up for vagrancy. <laughs> hey, you're not serious, are you? Oh, of course not. I... Oh, it's just that other people don't understand him like we do, and I'd hate to see anything happen to him. <laughs> so would I. I know that look on your face. No! <laughs> Nothing's gonna happen to him. He'll go downtown and... No. <laughs> we just got through talking about the exact... Besides, where will he sleep? No, honey. Well, just for tonight, though. Call him before he gets too far away. Mr. Finley! <laughs> uh, we, uh... Did you forget something? No. Did you call me? <laughs> we were wondering if you'd like to spend the night here. Well... You're changing all my plans, but I wouldn't want to offend you. you were calling, Roger. No. For you. <laughs> Hello? Oh, no. Uh, Murph's dog didn't come home all night. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, well, of course. Of course he won't mind. Right. I won't mind what? Uh, darling, I told Murph you'd drive him around the neighborhood to look for Francis. Honey, this is Saturday. I was planning to sleep till 10. Kathy has their car. The poor man is frantic. He's called the pound. It'll only take you a minute to jump into your clothes. Come on, sweetheart. It's the least we can do. No. <clears throat> now, Francis. Uh, answer the phone, Father. I'm busy. Now I have another set of 10 questions, Francis. Uh, Excuse me. Fifty-eight affirmatives. Hello? Hello, Sonny. If you find your father's muffler, send it to the third park bench from the left in Pershing Square. <laughs> I'll tell him. Forty-one negatives. Father, you had another call. <laughs> Has Mr. Angel come back yet? No. Well, I hope they have better luck finding Francis than I did. Hello? 
This is me again, son. Your daddy broke his leg, but you mustn't worry. I'm setting the bone myself. <laughs> Does he answer the phone when you call, Mr. Finley? Oh, yes. He'll call right back. You'll see. But you've called several times and he has... By the way, have you given him our number? That's why he hasn't called. <laughs> I knew there was a reason. <laughs> sure. Sonny, the number here at the park bench is Oxford 71717. <laughs> Now he'll call back and apologize. You'll see. He misses me. <laughs> I thought maybe the party line was using it. Come on, Mr. Finley. I want you to go out on the patio and get some fresh air. I'll call you if you when your son calls. I have a little work I want to clean up. All right. Just holler when he calls. I sure will. Vicky! Did you find Francis? No, Murph thinks he was stolen. He's calling the police. Oh, no. I see you got rid of our star boarder, huh? He's out in the patio, and don't you pick on him. If you're going to give up that easily, I'll find Francis myself. Uh, honey, let's carry on one conversation at a time. Uh, where are you going? First, I'm going to tell off a certain Roger Finley. Honey, let's stay... Just that poor man has called that no-good son of his at least ten times. First, he told him he was freezing to death on a park bench. And then he told him the cheap hotel was on fire. But he wasn't to worry. He was jumped out into a net he was holding himself. <laughs> <laughs> and you know that no-good Roger of his didn't even ask him to come home? If he'd have told me that, I wouldn't let him within 10 miles of the house. Oh, he doesn't expect Roger to believe him. He just wants to be invited back. Well, now Roger's going to beg his father to come home if I have to break his psychological neck. Uh, honey, as long as we seem to be mixed up in the middle of this, uh, why don't you let me get down there? No, Gus. You'd probably lose your temper. <laughs> now, let's get on with the questioning. Excuse me. Finley, I try not to inter... Francis! Well, honey, where have you been? I've been looking all over the neighborhood for you and here we are safe and sound with Mr. Finley. Mrs. Angel, oh, I suggest you stop that kind of talk. The dog will think you're a fool. <laughs> Do you realize the half the neighborhood has been looking for Francis here? When was the last time he had something to eat? Oh, he and I sat down to a meal just a few minutes ago. Oh, here's the entry. Friday, 11.10 p.m. 11.10 p.m.? That was last night. 11.10 p.m. Serves bacon and eggs. Animal has a tendency to eat too fast. Prefers eggs over easy. <laughs> Do you know that your father spent the night at our house, Mr. Finley? Please, Mrs. Angel, let me get on with the experiment. Francis, come over here. Francis? Is that tale of yours of any real value in your daily living? Do you expect him to answer that? Well, why not? You talked to him. Well, I did not. Well, you certainly did. You said, where have U been? We've been looking all over for U, and here U is all safe and sound with Mr. Finley. <laughs> well, I didn't expect him to understand me. Well, naturally, it was all I could do to follow your meaning. <laughs> Father, telephone. Mr. Finley is at our house. Your father is at our house. Do you hear me, Mr. Finley? Of course. Father! <laughs> Hello. Hello, Sonny. Your father is on a freight train. But uh, the number here is Oxford 71717. <laughs> Thank you. May I use your phone? I'm glad you asked me that. I left some leftover questions in the kitchen. Hello? Hello, Gus? Yeah, 
out. That's my son. Tell him I'm coming home and throw him out. I ran into the weirdest situation down here. I can match you weird for weird. <laughs> tell Mr. Finley, the one you have up there, tell him his son wants him to come home. He just informed me he is coming home and throwing Roger out. Mm. That's right. Why should I run away? I own the house. <laughs> Does Roger really want his father back? Well, it's a little hard to say, because he thinks his father is here. Honey, I'm getting sick and tired of these silly people. Come on home and let them fly apart by themselves. Now, it isn't as bad as it sounds. As far as I can tell, Roger's been working on an experiment all night and lost track of time. Oh, well, I guess we've all done that. Not like this, we haven't. <laughs> anyway, he's been carrying on these long, involved conversations with the dog, and that's what I want wait you to... Wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Back up. What did you just say? Honey, listen to me, and don't interrupt. Roger has Francis down here. He's not hurting him, he's just talking to him. And that's what you've got to make clear to Murph. Uh, make it clear to me first. <laughs> He's asking Francis this series of questions. Uh, he's asking the dog question? Yes, but that's not important. I'll be right there. <laughs> Gus. Now, these questions may not seem pertinent, Mrs. Angel, but I have a theory that any animal, intelligent animal, that lives among human beings all its life soon learns to understand what those humans are saying. Well, I imagine that's possible, but you don't have to explain it to me. Well, I just didn't want you to think I was being weird. <laughs> but I've seen this dog go out and bring in the morning paper at a command. Uh, not just paper, but go out and get the paper and bring it in. It's under the hedge, and he does it. And so when he wandered in this evening, I decided I'd do a little research. I've heard that animals react to a tone of voice. True. But how much tone can you put in the word hedge, Mrs. Angel? <laughs> now, I've noted four mannerisms that seem to indicate yes, and three which may suggest no. Really? Well, I'm not saying for certain that it's possible to communicate with this dog. I'm merely trying to find out. I guess there's no harm in trying. Mrs. Angel, since you seem to love the dog, and the dog obviously likes you, uh, why don't you ask him a question? No, thank you. Well, to quote you, there's no harm in trying. Question 212, Mrs. Angel. Just speak to him as though you were speaking to me. Francis. Oh, I can't. This is silly. For the sake of my experiment, Mrs. Angel, and just one or two questions, and I won't impose any more. Francis. Oh, really, Mr. Finn? <laughs> Please, Mrs. Angel. Francis, if you saw a very small dog carrying a bone, would you try to take it away from him? That means yes. Well, maybe he heard somebody outside, or maybe he itches or something. No, I don't think so. He usually reacts that way to that type of question. Uh, ask him 220. Francis, if you saw a great big dog carrying a bone, would you try to take it away from him? <laughs> oh, that means no. The animal is apparently a coward. Uh, try 221. Question 221, Francis. If you had your choice between a bowl of food and chasing a cat, would you chase the cat? Oh, well, that's not a fair question. It depends on how, how hungry he was at the time. Good thinking. Vicki, what in the world are you doing? Hi, honey. Mr. Finley's carrying on the most interesting experiment. So I see. Now I have a wife that talks to dogs. <laughs> I felt that way, too, at first about it. But, you know, Mr. Finley says that animals understand more than we think they do. That's all. Watch. Francis. Francis, listen to me a minute. Francis, if you saw a very small dog carrying a bone, would you try to take it away from him? That doesn't prove anything. Oh, his answers are 80% sensible out of 220 questions. See? I... 
Father, where have you been? You've had several phone calls. <laughs> Thank you, laddie. Isn't it pleasant around here now that I am back? Oh, I suppose so. Steve, I told you he'd miss me. What's he talking about? Father? Anyway, I'm glad the dog's safe. When I told Murph, he went screaming for the police. You don't believe all this stuff, do you? Oh, of course not. But you have to admit, it's, it's a fascinating idea. Francis, come here a minute. Francis. Question 222. Do you find it difficult to see with that ridiculous haircut? Oh, come on. <laughs> well, do you? I'll admit that could mean anything, but Mr. Finley says it means no. Uh, Francis, question 223. Do you have... Oh, well, this is a little more personal. Come on, ask him. He won't mind. Francis, do you have one particular lady friend whom you prefer... Well, <laughs> well hi, Murph. <laughs> Here's Francis. Hi, Francis. How's the boy? <laughs> Who are these people? Oh, they're my neighbors, and they're all right. <laughs> What are their names? And I don't think so. <laughs> Lady, were you talking to this dog? Well, yes, but you don't know what happened. What about you? Uh, what's your excuse? Me? I, I was just standing here. Look, the next time, don't call the police. Call the little men in the white coats. Oh, well, that's right. I must have gotten a little excited. I, I don't want to press no charges against nobody. When you call the police, you're spending taxpayers' money. Don't forget that. I hope you know what you're doing. Francis, it wasn't your fault, darling. No, it's going to be fine. Now. Don't you worry. I have a lady dog at home. If this animal tells you in the next conversation you have with him that he's not going steady, let me know, will you? <laughs> absolutely right, darling. And not only that, do you realize that after today, we are the boobs of the neighborhood? <laughs> Naturally, we are. We talk to dogs. Oh, and that police officer did everything but hand us a couple of dunks. <laughs> Here we go again. And we don't want any more cookies, either. Hi, kid. Hey, oh. Thanks a lot for helping me get Francis back. Come on, boy. <laughs> yeah. That's all right, Murph. Murph, you've got to find a way to keep that dog home. Oh, I got it all figured out. Vicky, explain to him he shouldn't jump over the fence. Well, why don't you try leaving the liver in your yard? The way it is now, he probably thinks he gets it as a, as a reward for jumping the fence. Thanks a lot. Well, we'll see you later, fellas, huh? <coughs> oh. Sick him! Oh. oh, don't worry. He don't eat nothing that ain't on a plate. <laughs> Now, say what you came to say, Sonny. Oh, Father. I understand I have put you to considerable inconvenience. Apologize, trouble we caused. Uh, we wish to apologize for the trouble we may have caused. Not we, I. I wish to apologize for the trouble I have caused. Apologies aren't necessary, Mr. By my experiment. By my... Oh, Father, for goodness sake. <laughs> well, it's all over, so let's forget it. Okay, now, Roger, tell him about your new experiment. My new... No. Good day. Roger? It has to do with human behavior. Because of you and Mr. Angel, I've discovered that people will believe anything that appears to be logical. Anything that appears to be logical? Like what? Like thinking you can talk to dogs. <laughs> Come on. You did that very well. You can bear it. How do you like that? I'm beginning to think you're right about this neighborhood. If there's one thing I can't stand, it's worrying every Francis, time the door... Come back here. Francis, come back here. Stop that. It's not even shouting. We want not have shouting in the neighborhood. I want to come back. That I have enough trouble with my
date with an angel, going to meet her at seven. Got a date with an angel, and I'm on my way to heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, your Plymouth dealer invites you to watch the Lawrence Welk program Top Tunes and You Tell It on this same network. Tom Kennedy speaking. Good night, everybody.